Will a high-tech computer microchip inserted under the skin in the forehead someday become the mark of the beast? You're about to find out on His Voice Today. Welcome to another His Voice Today with Steve Wolberg. The title of today's message is called Marked in the Forehead. We're going to take a look at one of the hottest and most controversial issues found in God's book in Bible prophecy. In the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 16 and 17, we have a stunning prophecy about what is going to happen in the future. Verse 16 says, And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Millions of people, including me, believe that we are definitely living in the last days of human history. There are just so many indicators all around us that Jesus Christ is coming soon and that it won't be long until we find ourselves in the middle of the final crisis. And because of that, and because of verses like this about the mark of the beast in the forehead and in the hand, uh, there, there are a lot of people that are just scouring the landscape. They're going on the internet. They're looking at developments that are taking place in the political arena and in the scientific arenas. And they are trying to figure out whether the mark of the beast is even now at the door. If you go on the internet, which I did just yesterday, and do an internet search for mark of the beast, microchip, computers, things like that, you will find a whole host of articles and, and different kinds of documentation that are attempting to prove that the mark of the beast is about to be enforced. I've got a stack of some of these articles in my hand, and let me just share some of the information that I, that I discovered. Uh, here's an article that came out from a ministry called These Last Days. February 13, 2013, the title is, Will the Mandatory, Mandatory Microchip in Obamacare End Up Being the Mark of the Beast? It says here on March 23, 2013, the microchip in the Affordable Care Act of 2010 will become mandatory. There's, that's a pretty startling thing inside the bill that 95% of Americans will not like. Obamacare has a microchip implant for you. The Obama health care bill includes under class 2 paragraph 1 section B a class 2 device that is implantable. It says this article that it is approved by the FDA that this implantable device is an implantable quote radio frequency transponder system for patient identification and health information. The article goes on and talks about even kids will be required to get this, this um, implantable device. The program is called Children's Health Insurance Program. It's part of Obamacare, and it's uh, abbreviated CHIP. And it says eventually uh, everyone will be implanted with a chip. It's a pretty scary idea. Now, as I flip the pages to another article, it says here that the technology for the mark of the beast is here now and it has to do with uh, devices under the skin that are called smart skin devices. This article continues and say, it talks about skin-mounted electronics that contain a diverse array of electronic components that can be mounted on a thin rubbery substrate including sensors, LEDs, transistors, wireless antennas, and solar cells for power. And you know, as people read articles like this and uh, they look at their Bibles and what the Bible says about the mark going in the forehead, uh, there's a lot of people that just look at this and look at the Bible and think that this must be it. This must be the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. But as you keep reading some of these articles, then some glitches come into the mix, uh, like this one. Here's another article that says Vera chip microchip implants cause fast-growing malignant tumors in lab animals. And this talks about a, a report that came out from the Associated Press, a breaking story that revealed that microchip implants have induced cancer in laboratory animals and dogs. 
The Associated Press will report a series of research articles spanning more than a decade, finding that mice and rats injected with glass-encapsulated RFID transponders developed malignant, fast-growing, lethal cancers in up to 10% of the cases. And one observer that was uh, looking at this, this reality made a comment that these new revelations change everything. Why would anyone take the risk of having a cancer chip in their arm? Well, I continued to read, and I found some more potential problems with the technology uh, idea of microchips implanted in everybody's heads or hands. Here it says, concerning microchip implants that someone named Katrina Michael, associate professor, professor of the University of Wollongong School of Information Systems and Technology, this was her comment. She said, at this moment, uh, it's not likely that these implants will be used wisely, widely because it will be a life sentence to upgrades, virus protection mechanisms, and inescapable intrusion into human lives. Uh, and so, you know, I know that people are talking about microchips. I know that there are those that want to see this happen, but there are others that are doing research and saying that they can cause cancer, that uh, they can cause all kinds of problems. And, and just think about the practicalities of something like this. Let's say that something was in, implanted in the skin of the forehead or in the hand, some kind of high-tech uh, device. I mean, what if, what if they developed a virus? Uh, what if hackers decided to you know, hack into the system and hack into your hand or into your head? Uh, what if they continue to need upgrades? What if the technology wears out? You know, as with computers, I've got my, my laptop in front of me and operating systems are changing all the times, all the time. So if you think of the logistics of technology, you know, going in the skin, on the hand, and in the forehead, uh, it's, it's really pretty mind-boggling. You know, I thought about this and I've, I've got my smartphone right here and I thought, well, you know, could this develop at some point so that people could have, they could have calendars in their hands, they could have... Um, you know, their entire schedule, they could play games, video games, they could download things from the internet. Uh, you know, I, I think the technology is probably out there, but the, the potential for logistical problems is enormous. But then somebody might say, but Steve, uh, you know, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that there's going to be a mark that's going to be placed in the hand and in the forehead. And let me tell you that I believe in the Bible. I believe exactly what it says, but I can't help but wonder whether this whole topic uh, reveals something that is more than skin deep. So let's, let's go deep. Let's analyze this topic. Let's take a look from the Bible and see what we can find. Uh, there's a verse in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17, that says, the first to present his case seems right until another comes forward and questions him. I, th I think about the time when Jesus was first born in Bethlehem. The religious leaders of the day, they were absolutely sure that they had, they had things figured out. They knew that when the Messiah came, finally he was going to conquer the Romans, he was going to um, exalt Israel, and everything was going to change for the better. That was their view, that the Messiah was going to be a strong military leader. They just knew that was true. I mean, they were just convinced. And they had, they had certain Bible verses in the Old Testament that they thought supported their case. But it didn't really happen quite that way. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, uh, he did not come to conquer the Romans. He didn't come to exalt the nation of Israel like the rabbis thought. Uh, he came to do something very different. He came to live a meek, humble, lowly life and eventually to die upon a cruel cross for the sins of the world and then to rise from the dead. And uh, if, there, if there's any big lesson that we can learn from history is that uh, the majority, even of those that comment on the Bible, may not be right. If the Jewish people made a big mistake, the majority at least, in, in the time of the first coming of Jesus Christ, what about our time? What about the time as we're nearing the second coming of Jesus Christ and Bible prophecy? Uh, is it possible that when people think they've got it all figured out that it just may not quite happen that way? Well, let's find out. Let's just keep that in mind and let's take a close look at what the Bible says about 
the mark of the beast being placed in the forehead. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9, gives us a warning about the mark of the beast. Verse 9 says that the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worships the beast, now notice that word beast, and his image and receives his mark in the forehead or in the hand. So, uh, first of all, before we actually look closer at the forehead idea, uh, we need to, to keep in mind, we need to remember, we, we mustn't forget that the mark of the beast, whatever it is, is something that comes from the beast. B-E-A-S-T, from the beast. Now, when you read the book of Revelation and you look at what Revelation says about the beast, uh, it's very obvious that there is a lot of what I call sacred symbolism that is being used in these prophecies. Revelation 13 verse 1 says, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and John said, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his, he his horns were ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Verse 2 says that this beast was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth was like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So here is a beast with seven heads, ten horns, a body like a leopard, mouth like a lion, feet like a bear, and then this dragon gives him his power. Now obviously, uh, there's not going to be any real, literal, seven-headed, ten-horned beast that's going to be running around. Uh, this is a symbol of something else. It's a symbol of, uh, of Antichrist, but it is a symbol. It's not something that we should be taking, taking literally. We find lots of symbols in Revelation. Revelation chapter 17 also talks about a woman. In Revelation 17 verse 3, John wrote, He carried me away in the spirit and I saw a woman. She was sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And this woman was all uh, decked out with various jewels. She had a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and fornication. And verse 5 says, Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now obviously, just like the beast, this woman is a symbol. And it is significant that this woman has something on her forehead. And as we think about the mark which is enforced on the forehead, uh, again, the mark comes from the beast. And the beast is a symbolic beast that represents something else. The mark of the beast is perhaps one of the most misunderstood mysteries of the Bible, but it need not be. Speaker Steve Wahlberg explains the Mark of the Beast in his eye-opening series titled Mark of the Beast Mysteries. Mark of the Beast Mysteries is a four-part DVD series for only $19.95. To order your set today, call 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-782-4253. You can also order this series on our website, www.whitehorsemedia.com. Now what about the forehead? Let's analyze this forehead idea. Uh, we know that the beast and the woman are symbolic. But what about the forehead? Is this also used in a symbolic way in the Bible? Well, we just read in chapter 17, verse 5, that upon the forehead of this woman was this name, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots. Obviously, there's not going to be a real woman riding a seven-headed, ten-horned beast that's going to be running around with something literal on her, on her head, uh, between her eyes, above her nose. So, symbolism is involved. If you go back to chapter 14, Right after Revelation warns about the mark of the beast going in the forehead, verse 1 in chapter 14, John wrote, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, this is not the devil's people, but this is a revelation of God's people called the 144,000, and they have God's name in their foreheads. Now, do you think this means that God is going to write something uh, on the skin, above the nose, between the eyes of this group called the 144,000 so that when people look at them, they see writing? Or is that writing uh, a symbol of something else? In chapter 22 of Revelation, the last chapter of God's book, in verse 4, this is talking about all of the saved 
from all ages who all are finally gathered together into one group and who enter eternity and who live with Jesus forever. And in verse 4 it says that they shall see his face and his name, meaning the name of God, shall be in their foreheads. So here it says that all of God's people are going to have something in their foreheads, not just the 144,000. Now what does this mean? Does that mean that throughout all eternity, uh, if I were to run into you or you were to talk to me, that we would look on each other's foreheads and we could see God's name written on our skin? Do you think that's really what it means? I don't think so. And, and I'm not just speculating. I'm not just guessing. I've got uh, solid facts behind my conclusions and let me share them with you. The idea of the forehead in Revelation and the hand actually goes back to the Old Testament. There are Old Testament roots for much of what we find in Revelation and it's certainly true when it comes to the forehead and the hand. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we have a very famous statement of Moses to the Israelites. It's called the, the Shema. Jewish people call this the Shema where Moses told Israel about their obligations to the Lord. And in verse 4, Moses wrote, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you, these words of God, shall be inside your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And then in verse 8, Moses said, and you shall bind these words for a sign, which is like a mark, for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. So Moses said that God's words were to be like a sign on the hand and right here between the eyes in the forehead. Now, if you think, of, if you think about what this means, God didn't mean for the Israelites to literally take the words of Deuteronomy, the whole book, and put it on the hand or on the head. Uh, those Jewish people would have, would have had to have had very large foreheads in order to get the whole book of Deuteronomy on the skin. Uh, obviously, it does not mean that. God's intention in giving this prophecy meant that his word, his word was to be on the hand representing their actions and the forehead representing, in the forehead representing their thoughts. In other words, God wanted his word to be in the minds of his people and he wanted them to do it, to carry it out in their practical lives. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, we find the same idea. Deuteronomy 11 verse 18, Moses told the Jewish people, he said, therefore you shall lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand and that they may be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall teach them to your children. So again, just a little bit of uh, enlightened reflection and Holy Spirit discernment will help us to understand that in the Old Testament, the forehead and the hand represented the mind and it represented the actions uh, and God wanted his word to be in those two places. Now when we get to the book of Revelation, we find a prophecy in chapter 14 verse 9 that one of these days this beast will enforce his own mark into the foreheads and into the hands of the majority of people around planet earth. And again, we know that the beast is a symbol. It's not a literal beast. And if the beast is clearly a symbol and the mark of the beast is his mark, uh, it certainly makes logical sense that uh, if the beast is symbolic, that the mark could possibly be symbolic as well and that it could represent something that the devil through the beast places into the mind, into the minds and into the actions of the majority of people around the world at the end of time. So they are bombed out of eternity. It really does make perfect sense. There are many examples in the New Testament 
of mistakes that were made by certain groups of people who heard the things that Jesus said and didn't see the spiritual meaning underneath his words. Uh, one perfect example is in John chapter, chapter 2 where Jesus was talking to a group of religious leaders and in verse 18 uh, answered, the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us? seeing that you do these things. And in verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, if you destroy this temple, I will rebuild it in three days. So that was the sign. And Jesus told them, they asked for a sign. He said, okay, here's my sign. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. Now, when those uh, particular people heard Jesus' statement, verse 20 says, then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? They interpreted his words about a temple, uh, they interpreted them literally. They thought he, he meant the literal temple that was in Jerusalem that had been built up by King Herod. Forty-six years it took to build that temple. But that's not what Jesus was talking about. They just saw the words of Jesus literally, but verse 21 says he spoke of the temple of his body. It was a spiritual temple that Jesus Christ was talking about, not a literal one. We find examples of this over and over again in the New Testament. In John chapter 3, Jesus told Nicodemus he must be born again. But he thought literally and said, how can I go back in my, into my mother's womb and be born? But Jesus was talking about a spiritual birth. In John 4, Jesus offered a woman uh, the water of life, and she thought he was talking about literal water down in the well. But he was talking about the spiritual water of life. Uh, in John chapter 6, Jesus told a group of people, you, had, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood or you don't have eternal life. And they thought he was talking about cannibalism, but really he was talking about his word, about the word of God, the word of Jesus Christ, his own words that they needed to take in to their hearts and into their lives. So with all this information, when we get back to the book of Revelation, and Revelation warns us about a mark that is coming from a beast that is going to be enforced into the foreheads and into the hands of people around the world, uh, it just makes perfect sense that we would look at this prophecy as applying to something more than skin deep. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of the Persian Gulf War that took place in 1990, 1991. The Iraqis had invaded Kuwait and they were getting close to controlling a lot of oil and this galvanized many of the world nations to put together a coalition led by the United States called Operation Desert Storm to go into Kuwait and to liberate that country. And it's, uh, it's very significant that one of the main strategies of the Allies was, was decoy attacks. Here I've got a report that says U.S. decoy attacks by Air attacks and naval gunfire the night before Kuwait's liberation were designed to make the Iraqis believe that the main coalition ground attack would focus on central, central Kuwait, but it didn't. This was a decoy. It was a strategy to get the Iraqis looking in one direction when the bulk of the uh, attacks came from another direction. And in the Gulf War, that strategy was very effective. It was very effective. Uh, military strategies of decoys work very well. And don't, don't forget that the commander of, uh, of all of the hosts of darkness, his name is Lucifer, and he is a master strategist. And he knows how to get people looking in one direction when really uh, the truth is coming from another direction. He convinced many Jewish people in the time of Christ to look one direction for the coming of a Messiah who they thought was going to be a military leader who would conquer the Romans and exalt the Jews. Uh, and yet that was, a, that was a decoy that was uh, developed in the councils of the Prince of Darkness. And when the real Jesus actually came and he didn't come to do what that decoy was designed to get people to think he was going to do, what happened was they, they, they missed him they missed him or who he was entirely, and they ended up crucifying their own Messiah. All of this information needs to keep us on our toes. We need to 
carefully look at the Bible. We need to make sure that we're not being uh, led astray by decoys, by false theories, by uh, prophetic misinformation that is designed strategically by a very smart enemy to direct us away from the biblical facts. The book of Revelation warns us in chapter 14, verse 9, that the third angel follows them and says with a loud voice, if any man worships the beast, which is obviously a symbol, and his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine, verse 10 says, of the wrath of God. This is a very important subject, very serious, and we can't afford to make any mistakes, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. The scripture continues, he'll be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In our next program, we will uh, actually identify what the mark of the beast is. It's going to be uh, very controversial. Uh, it's one you don't want to miss. You want to wear all your seatbelts when we come to that topic, and we're going to look at it very carefully right from the Bible to find out what the Word of God actually says. The Bible is very clear in the Old Testament that the forehead represented the mind and the hands represented the actions. And as we approach the final hours of history, we want to make sure that we have God's truth in our foreheads and that it will be carried out in our actions. You have just heard His voice today. We hope you've enjoyed this timely message from Pastor Steve Wolberg, and we want you to know that White Horse Media is deeply committed to bringing you many more simple messages straight from the Bible, designed to educate the mind, inspire the heart, and help bring our viewers and their families closer to God. To learn more about White Horse Media, or to watch more of Pastor Steve's television programs online, including his powerful new series of two-minute talks, visit hisvoicetoday.com. That's hisvoicetoday.com. If you have any prayer requests, you can email them to us at prayerrequests at hisvoicetoday.com. If you would like a free copy of Steve Wolberg's audio CD, Behold a White Horse, you can call us at 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-78-BIBLE. We hope you will join us next time for another inspiring His Voice Today presentation with Steve Wolberg.